Hi, my name is Philip Gilly, and I'm an assistant professor of audiology and the principal investigator of the Neurodynamics Laboratory at the University of Colorado at Boulder. This talk was first given in March 2014 at the Ignite SLHS series sponsored by the Graduate Advisory Board, and I would certainly like to thank the board for that opportunity. Today I would like to share with you some of my thoughts on functional brain networks that are mediated by oscillatory neural coupling and how brain rhythms generated by these networks underlie the physiology and pathophysiology of communication. Understanding how the brain facilitates communication, including speech, language, and hearing, reading, thinking, and expressing emotion, is integral to understanding human behavior and is therefore integral to shaping behavior and to successful remediation of disorders that affect communication. When information is transferred across the synapse between two neurons, extracellular currents are generated at the dendrites of the receiving neurons. These neuronal currents then spread through the brain to the scalp where they can be monitored by a recording electrode. When clusters of neurons fire synchronously in response to a stimulus, the resulting change in the EEG voltage, called an evoked potential, can be observed as a peak in the EEG waveform. Sometimes, whether occurring spontaneously or evoked by a stimulus, clusters of neurons fire synchronously and rhythmically over time. The EEG patterns observed from this activity represent a quasi-periodic wave function, which reflects the mass action of a neuronal cluster. All told, the EEG takes an oscillatory-like pattern. However, when groups of neurons fire in such a pattern, a signal is transmitted to other neuronal clusters that are connected both anatomically and functionally. Activity from a group of cells at one point in time that triggers activity in another group of cells at a later point in time appears as an oscillation in the EEG, such that the orientation, or polarity, of the peaks reflect the physical orientation of the neurons that generated that response. From this, we can infer that oscillatory EEG might represent the functional connections between different brain regions. A well-defined example of such functional connectivity can be observed in a series of responses called the auditory evoked potentials, which are peaks that appear in the EEG when hearing a sound. These peaks can be defined by their orientation, their amplitude, and their peak latency, that is, when they occur relative to the onset of a sound. They can also be described by their oscillatory period, or frequency of the peak. When processing a sound, energy transduced by the cochlea generates action potentials at the auditory nerve, which leads to peak activity in the cochlear nucleus, then the superior olivary complex, the nucleus of the lateral lemniscus, and the inferior colliculus. Each of these contribute to peaks in a waveform known as the auditory brainstem response, which is shown here on the left. From the brainstem, information is then transmitted to the auditory thalamus and cortex, which contribute to the middle latency and cortical responses, shown here on the left as well. Finally, higher order cortical regions contribute to the so-called late potentials, which reflect cognition and executive function. Taken together, this pattern of sequential processing represents several hierarchies of functional brain activity. There is an axial spatial hierarchy, such that incoming information enters the nervous system at lower regions and higher level processing takes place in higher brain regions. Neuronal circuits at the lower level of this axial hierarchy generate oscillatory activity that is relatively higher in frequency. And conversely, higher level processes generate low frequency oscillations. When detecting a stimulus, peak changes in high frequency oscillatory activity occur earlier than changes in low frequency activity. These hierarchies reflect a rather traditional account of bottom-up processing, and we can further exploit these relationships to better understand the underlying brain activity. In order to further explore these functional networks, we recorded EEG from 64 channels on the scalp in a group of young adults during an auditory entrainment task.
A speech sound was repeated at a regular and steady rate, while participants were asked to passively listen to the sounds. In this way, rhythmic oscillatory activity was entrained to the repetition rate of the sounds. We then performed a high-resolution spectral temporal analysis of the EEG waveforms from each channel. This separates the signal into a series of frequency-specific bands that can be represented in a three-dimensional time frequency plane, in much the same way that speech is often represented across time and frequency in a speech spectrogram. Essentially, this is a spectrogram of the EEG activity called a scalagram, or an event-related spectral perturbation. In this group average response, we see time represented along the abscissa, or x-axis, and frequency along the ordinate axis. Magnitude is represented by color. The onset of the speech sound is marked by the arrow, and here we can also see a representation of the spectral temporal hierarchy of processing as shown by this thick blue line. With this data, we can also take the mean across either dimension to find the mean temporal envelope and the mean spectral envelope for each response. These envelopes provide information about where in the time frequency plane we can filter the responses. We then identified the spectral peaks from each participant and then clustered all of the participants' peak frequencies by commonly observed spectral peaks. This clustering revealed 15 common peaks within seven frequency bands. From low frequency to high frequency, these bands are the delta band, the theta band, the alpha band, beta 1, beta 2, gamma 1, and gamma 2 at the highest end. From each spectral peak, an independent components analysis, or ICA, is used to separate the spatial distributions of that activity and its contribution to the global EEG activity. These spatial maps are then used to localize the brain sources separately for each peak using a current density reconstruction algorithm. To visualize these complex sources, each source will be represented in six different views of the brain, two views each of the left and right cortical surfaces, a view of the top of the brain in the upper middle panel, and a view of the front of the brain in the lower middle panel. The brain activity shown here highlights the oscillatory activity of these underlying functional networks. The color of activity in the brain corresponds with the color shown in the CDR spectrum in the lower right corner, where the height of each bar represents the relative contribution of that frequency at a given point in time. To examine the contributions of different networks, we can then adjust the display filter to only show activity from a specified frequency band. For example, here we see the components in the delta band. Now, these likely act as a central entrainment mechanism for binding the active networks. This delta activity includes activity in the midbrain and limbic structures, including the thalamus, and then extends into regions of medial and inferior temporal cortex. More specifically, the bursts of delta activity represented in the peaks of the temporal envelope, the lower left portion of the figure, occur when maximal activity is near the thalamus. The alpha activity, seen here, appears to volley in a left-to-right fashion, um, including through the dorsal portion of the cingulate cortex, the precuneus, and the auditory cortex. Now, there are several hypotheses about function of alpha activity, but many leading accounts suggest alpha as a reflection of allocating attention resources during a process. Here we see the peak alpha activity occurring in auditory regions of the temporal cortex. The beta-1 activity, seen here, also volleys in a left-to-right fashion, including in the thalamus, the medial and inferior temporal lobes, the auditory cortex, and the parietal cortex. Specifically, the bursts of activity between about 50 and 150 milliseconds occur in the auditory cortex. The gamma-1 activity, which may relate to feature extraction and selective attention, includes activity in the cingulate cortex, the auditory cortex, and the superior temporal lobes, and some activity in the cerebellum. Here again, we see the source reconstructions with all of the bands displayed.
The source models indicate that auditory processing is mediated by several functional brain networks that extend beyond the classical ascending auditory pathways shown earlier. This includes activity in the limbic system with integrative and cognitive networks and even motor networks, which include the cerebellum. Recall that these oscillatory frequencies are related to the sequential order of bottom-up processing. Here again, we see the nuclei of the ascending auditory system. While it is relatively straightforward to see how each of these regions can affect each other during processing, less transparent is how other brain processes affect functions in these auditory regions. To address this issue, I conducted a meta-analysis of over 450 candidate connections between 128 distinct regions in the central nervous system and mapped these connections in an organizational structure that helps to describe the dynamical relationships between different areas in the nervous system. This organization groups brain regions with common functions, such as the visual system, auditory and motor systems, and others, as shown here by this organizational map. Brain regions are also organized by axial hierarchy, such that the head, neck, and body are near the bottom of the map, and higher-level executive cortex is at the top. Finally, the map is organized by five dynamical systems, including transduction, FATS encoding, which is the encoding of information related to frequency, amplitude, time, and space, association and integration functions, executive functions, and modulatory functions, including chemical and visceral modulation. Together, this map represents a basis for connectivity and modulation between different functional brain networks. Further, this model of brain processing may be clinically useful for the differential diagnosis and treatment of disorders that affect different sensory systems, including the auditory system. For example, if we can identify where in the auditory network an impairment is occurring, then treatment can be targeted at that impaired process. One example of this application is the diagnosis and treatment of child language learning problems. In 2007, Merdula Sharma and her colleagues in Sydney showed that over 75% of children with language learning problems could be clinically diagnosed with more than one impairment, depending on which clinical battery was used for the assessment. So if we can identify specific brain processes that underlie each of these behavioral impairments, then we can improve differential diagnosis and targeted treatment for this population of children. We compared time frequency responses in typically developing children and in children with language learning problems. Those responses showed an atypical spectral temporal hierarchy in children with learning problems. Further, when the timing of the stimuli were randomized, the spectral power of the beta and alpha activity were significantly diminished in children with learning problems. An analysis of the frequency coherence spectrum shows that children with listening problems had two different beta peaks compared to their normal hearing peers, which may suggest a desynchronization or a decoupling of oscillatory networks in these children. In another study, we compared responses in typically hearing children and in children with listening problems both with and without a clinically diagnosed auditory processing disorder. Responses in quiet revealed the expected spectral temporal hierarchies, but with diminished beta and alpha responses when listening in background noise. Interestingly, when comparing the peak frequencies of each detected band, Children with auditory processing disorders showed a lower frequency in the beta band compared to the other groups. And this further corroborates the notion that beta decoupling is reflected by poor auditory processing. Here, we show the peak frequencies of each response like beads on a string along an imaginary x-axis with low frequencies in the delta band on the left to higher frequencies in the gamma band on the right. In the case of auditory processing disorders, we might think of this beta band as being knocked off the string. A further analysis of these peak frequencies from all of the children revealed a very interesting trend. Note that we also have an imaginary y-axis here. The y-axis also represents frequency 
but these frequencies are harmonics of the stimulus rate. Note that each peak frequency was very near a harmonic of the stimulus rate. And also for you math geeks, you might notice that these harmonics start to approximate a Lucas sequence. Fun stuff. So taken together, it is possible that different regions of the brain connect to a functional network, that is a network that is actively engaged in a common goal, by changing or modulating the operating frequencies to a harmonic within that network. In this way, functional networks become harmonically coupled. This mechanism of network binding could have implications for understanding modulatory functions, such as selective attention. For example, a harmonic network might be established for extracting information from a target talker, so that each component of the harmonic network contributes to the behavioral goal, that is, understanding what the talker is saying. If a second harmonic network is established from a competing talker, then attention resources can be allocated to the network receiving the relevant information, and then suppressing information from the competing talker. This mechanism might also explain the observation of multiple beta peaks in children with auditory processing disorders, as if the beta oscillators were somehow unable to couple with the correct network. Overall, this hierarchical model of processing and the model of harmonic oscillatory coupling provide fascinating new insights into dynamical brain networks and their implications for clinical application. We hope that our future research further brings to light the nature of these brain rhythms. Thank you very much.